People and companies get hacked all the time. Corporate secrets, credit card numbers, password to your email, your medical information, even your Netflix login might get stolen. But where does that data go? Today, we're doing a deep dive into the hacked data economy. We'll also speak with Troy Hunt, founder of Have I Been Pwned, a tool that lets you know if your data has been breached. This is incognito mode. There are a few types of hackers. There's state-sponsored hacking groups or advanced persistent threats. There's hacktivists, and then there's criminal hackers. State-sponsored hackers are typically going to be hacking for espionage, blackmail, purposes that serve the state that they're sponsored by. There's also hacktivists, which go after companies or other organizations that they have some problem with. Think a weapons manufacturer or a police department. And then there's criminal hackers. These types of hackers are pretty indiscriminate. They'll go after any system where they can steal data and then make money from that data in one way or another. What happens to your data after it gets stolen really depends on who did the hacking. If it's a state-sponsored hacker, we might not know what happens to that data. Because state-sponsored hackers are acting on behalf of their own government, the data often goes into a black box, and as an outsider, it's really hard to know what happens to that data. One of the largest data breaches in history, it happened at Equifax, the company that tracks all your credit cards and mortgages to determine your credit score. In the case of Equifax, tens of millions of people's data was stolen, but we've never seen that data surface online. Sometimes the data is leaked. Think Russia's hack of the Democratic National Committee, which had all its emails published online. A U.S. government investigation into the Russian hack of the DNC found that one of the main reasons for the breach was to release the data and cause chaos in the U.S. political system. We don't know if they did anything else with the data as well. In the case of a breach by hacktivists, the hackers will often steal the data and then share that with journalists or maybe just post it themselves online. Notorious hacking group Anonymous has declared war on Russia. Russian government, Russian military records being dumped out onto the internet. The goal is really to embarrass, shame, and cause problems for whatever entity that they've hacked. Hacks by cyber criminals are probably what you think of when you think of getting hacked. When criminal hackers break into a system, they'll often steal as much data as they can. Think credit card numbers, your email and passwords, your medical information. From there, it gets sold and traded to other criminal hackers. And by the time you know that your credit card has been stolen, it may have been posted online multiple times. While any hacker might post information online, it's a criminal hack where you'll most likely see your information exposed. So if you go to a website like Have I Been Pwned and see that your information was breached, it was probably a criminal hack. Some state-sponsored hackers blur the lines and get into criminal hacking. North Korea, for example, is involved in billions of dollars worth of theft of cryptocurrencies either through ransomware attacks or hacking crypto exchanges directly. It's widely believed North Korean hackers use the stolen money to fund the government, including its nuclear weapons program. There are two main ways that criminal hackers make money. One is selling your data, and the other is ransomware. First, we'll talk about ransomware. Ransomware is a type of malware that allows a hacker to go into a system, steal the data, and then encrypt the system so it's unusable. You often see hospitals, government organizations, and other entities that need to function get targeted by ransomware. They'll say, if you don't pay me, say, 200 Bitcoin, we're gonna leak your data online. When we're talking about medical information or financial information, this is really sensitive and could be extremely damaging, not just to you, but to the organization itself. A victim organization typically has two choices. They can either pay or not. If they choose not to pay, and the hackers do leak the data, the victim organization is just going to have to deal with the fallout from that, and likely have to have some type of way to mitigate the attack and get back online and continue their operation. The other option, which experts highly advise against because it encourages other ransomware attacks, is to pay the ransom. This happened to change healthcare when in 2024, there were victims of a ransomware attack and ultimately paid 350 Bitcoin, or around $22 million, to the hacker group. Unfortunately for Change Healthcare, a second hacker group got its hands on the data and appeared to post it online. So even though Change Healthcare paid a fortune to keep their data from getting leaked online, it still happened, and they didn't get much out of it. Another way hackers make money is by just selling your data online. So what does that mean exactly, and what does that look like? So if your data is sold, it's often packaged together, auctioned off, and paid for. This is a massive underground economy and what we call the hacked data pipeline. Newly stolen data often first appears in private groups like hacker networks, forums, and group chats before it ever hits the open market. You can think of this as the wholesale distribution step, where hackers share the data with trusted sources and try to unload it all at once for a huge sum. From there, the data makes its way to dark web marketplaces. The dark web isn't searchable with normal tools like Google, and you have to use a special browser called a Tor browser to access dark web sites. Tor Browser is just like any other browser, except it protects you against surveillance and censorship when surfing the internet. 
It was developed to make it difficult for people to know who you are and what sites you're visiting. Dark web marketplaces provide anonymity for both sellers and buyers, making it ideal for cyber criminals. Hack data is also used to build tools to help protect people who've been affected by breaches. One of these tools is Have I Been Pwned. Troy Hunt, thanks for joining us. For somebody who's never like been on one of these kinds of forums, what does that look like? Well, they look just like a forum to comment on cats, you know. There's threads and comments and reputations and everyone's trying to be anonymous. It's a very recognizable environment. You've just got people there talking about crimes and exchanging personal data for their own benefit. What would you say is kind of the most sensitive data that ends up getting shared in these databases? So we categorize somewhere in the order of about 150 data classes, so different types of personal information. Uh, and by far, the number one most prevalent is email address. Passwords are still enormously prevalent as well, usually not in plain text these days. They're, they're hashed and protected to one degree or another. And after that, the most common attributes are things like name, phone number, physical address. But then if we go all the way through to the most sensitive end, we get anything from, say, government issued IDs, so it's things like a passport, a driver's license, through to the things that are, are deeply personal, like health data, and all the way through to sensitive topics about the desires that you have in the bedroom. And then something like Ashley Madison is a good example. Example of that. There are dozens of marketplaces for stolen data. Some of them include Sticks Market, Brian's Club, Russian Market, and Biden Cash. Some of these marketplaces have tens of thousands of listings. Often your data will be sold there alongside things like drugs, counterfeit items, or other cybercrime tools. Market prices for your data vary, but some are surprisingly cheap. For example, the details for a credit card with a $5,000 balance can go for as little as $110. A Netflix login could cost somebody as little as 10 bucks. Things like credit card info are usually sold in bulk, but for higher value data like corporate secrets, they're often auctioned off the highest bidder. Marketplaces are often controlled by groups or individuals based in Eastern Europe or in other areas that don't have extradition treaties with the United States like Russia or China. As you can imagine, most sales on dark web markets are made using cryptocurrency, which make it much more difficult to trace than something like a credit card or PayPal. Stolen data is often sold to other cyber criminals who use it for identity theft, taking over social media accounts, medical fraud, and more. Stolen emails, usernames, and passwords are often used for something called credential stuffing. This is when a cybercriminal tries a username and password on a bunch of different sites or services and tries to hack in. This works because people very often reuse the same password over and over again, allowing a criminal to get into an account even if they don't really know what the password is. So if the cybercriminal buys the login for your email address, they might then use that information to get into your social media accounts, message all your friends, and ask for money. They could also do something more straightforward, like get into your bank account and then just wire themselves all your money. Your stolen information can be used to open fraudulent bank accounts, apply for loans, or commit tax fraud. Your medical information might be used for insurance scams or to get prescription drugs. Once your information is posted online, it can be sold and resold and used by multiple hackers before you even know it's stolen. That means the hacker that stole your data isn't necessarily the same person who's putting fraudulent charges on your credit card. Even if the information is stolen is really basic, like just your name and your email address and phone number, that can still be used for phishing attacks in which cyber criminals send malicious links and get people to download malware. It can also be used to target you for scams. So if your phone number is leaked, scammers might have you on a list and text you trying to get you to send them money. Troy, you've been in this world doing this work for more than a decade. How would you say things have changed since the early days in terms of either the types of data, the frequency of breaches? The things that I have clearly seen change is, uh, for example, the way passwords are protected. If we go back to data breaches from 2012, LinkedIn, Dropbox, for example, the way the passwords were protected then and the hashing algorithms they used are not things that we see very often today, certainly not with any sort of large, significant organizations. Over the course of time, we've definitely seen different attack vectors, so different ways in which data has been obtained very frequently because different platforms have either gained popularity or there's been common vulnerabilities or misconfigurations. There was a while there where there was lots of MongoDB that was exposed and then there was a lot of Amazon S3 buckets exposed and then a lot of Elasticsearch instances exposed. So we're seeing that sort of vector change but we're not really seeing the fact that there's millions, hundreds of millions of email addresses and personal information appearing in data breaches every day. Do you feel like the public understanding of cybersecurity and cybersecurity practices has changed? Consumers, if anything, I feel are developing a little bit of apathy, where they're just like, ah, it's another data breach. Like, until something actually stings them in some way and they actually lose some money or there's a, there's a tangible impact to their privacy, 
we feel that there's probably not a lot of impact on consumers or not a lot of things that are changing. And we're hearing this term a little bit of data breach fatigue. For organisations, it, it, it's a tricky one. I feel organisations are increasingly standoffish when it comes to data breach. It's, I'm finding very, very often they're not disclosing to individuals and usually they have a legal right not to <laughs> disclose to individuals as well. They're particularly skittish about the things like class actions. It just seems like every data breach of any significance that happens, regardless of what the actual impact is on individuals, literally the next day, there's a law firm doing a class action. And I think organisations are adapting their behaviour to disclose much less information just due to fear of being then used in legal proceedings. So what can you do? Well, first, if you're notified of a breach and your data was stolen, make sure to change your password and not use that password anywhere else. In fact, the best thing to do is use a password manager. This allows you to create unique, difficult to crack passwords across every app and website you use. That way, if a hacker gets access to one password, they can't use it on another account. Even if you learn about a breach that happened months or even years ago, that data is still out there and the hacker or some other person might use that data in the future. Make sure to freeze your credit. If you're part of a breach where a lot of personal information that can be used in financial fraud is stolen, if someone takes out a credit card in your name and never pays the balance, which of course they're not going to do, it's not gonna tank your credit score and prevent you from getting loans or credit cards in the future. You'll also wanna get credit monitoring services so that you'll be alerted if somebody tries to open an account in your name. Another key step in practicing good security is to use multi-factor authentication everywhere it's available. It's important to use a tool that's trusted, like Google Authenticator or a YubiKey. Otherwise, your data might not be as safe as you think it is. Try to avoid SMS-based two-factor authentication. And finally, always aim to use apps and websites from companies that have a good security track record. This will reduce the chance that your data will get stolen in the first place. The fact of the matter is, if your data hasn't already been stolen, it's probably gonna happen at some point. But even if it is, it's still important to take steps to protect yourself because there can always be another breach that exposes more data and creates more risk for yourself. This has been Incognito Mode. Stay safe out there.